Hello, my name is Iris Verrooy, and this is a pre-recorded presentation for the 2020 meeting of the Society for Mathematical Psychology. This presentation is a part of a symposium titled Perspectives on what makes a good theory. And for context, let me say a few words on what motivates this symposium. It probably hasn't gone unnoticed that psychological science has been going through some turbulent times because of the replication crisis. Now the various reforms uh, that this has motivated seem to have focused on experimental and statistical practices. But there now seems to also be a growing consensus that improving psychological science also necessitates improving theoretical practices. But as usually there is no clarity or consensus yet on, on what this entails exactly. And this motivates this symposium, which, which asks a group of mathematical psychologists and computational cognitive scientists to reflect on the question, what makes a good theory, and to give our perspective. Now, before I give my own perspective, let me briefly note the other awesome presenters in this uh, symposium. Uh, be sure to also check out their talks. Uh, but please uh, don't do it yet, do it later. Uh, let me first tell you about my perspective on what makes a good theory. I should note that the perspective I present builds on collaborative work over a longer period of time, and in particular on recent joint work with Josue Baggio and Mark Blockpool. The thesis I will be defending in the next few minutes is that good theories are possible. By this I do not just mean that it's possible to have good theories in psychology, though I also think that is the case. But rather the claim is that good theories are those that postulate processes and mechanisms that are possible. Now this may seem obvious, but inspection of standard research practice in psychology suggests otherwise. To illustrate this, let me pose as a contrast what I take to be the more received view. The received view in psychology is that good theories make testable predictions. This fits a view of science as progressing solely via the empirical cycle. That is, the iterative process of deriving predictions and testing them and then revising theories according to the outcomes of such tests. This view has led to a relative neglect of good theory building prior to testing. There are at least two problems I see with this received view. First, it doesn't say how we come up with theories in the first place. How do we get good candidate theories on the table before we start testing predictions? Second, it pitches theories as if their purpose is to be tested. But in my view, Theories are not for testing, nor for prediction, but instead they are for explanation. If theories are for explanation, what are the target phenomena to explain? Well, the answer to this may depend on the subfield of psychology under study, but let's take cognitive psychology as an example. For cognitive psychology, the key phenomena to explain are the various real-world capacities that humans have. For instance, humans have a capacity for social cognition and communication. And using these capacities, they can navigate complex social situations. They also have the capacity for interpreting complex visual scenes and to make complex decisions, for instance, which coffee to order, and they can make plans on how to achieve these goals. For instance, how to make sure that you have enough money to pay for the coffee. How are these capacities possible? Explaining this is beyond the current state of the art. Of course, psychologists do study these capacities. So how do they do that? Well, they do that by trying to bring them from the real world into the lab by carefully designing experiments using toy scenarios 
psychologists try to capture uh, real-world capacities, but in a way that makes them amenable to experimental control and testing. For most experimental psychologists, it may stop here. Um, tests are performed and verbal explanations are postulated for the observed effects. So mathematical psychologists and computational modelers, on the other hand, may, may go one step further and they may make uh, sophisticated models of the experimental tasks and perhaps observe that their models nicely fit and predict the experimental data. Rarely, however, is the question asked if the models of verbal explanations of the observations made in the lab can be scaled back to the real world, where the capacities we really want to explain actually operate. In other words, is the theory we have in mind that may have guided the task models actually possible as an explanation of the target real-world capacity? To illustrate this idea, uh, let us consider a simple example. Selecting toppings on a pizza. Evidently, this is a vital real-world capacity for many of us to survive in modern day world. I can only briefly sketch the example here, but if you would like to read more about it, check out chapter one of the textbook that I co-wrote with Mark Blockpool, uh, Johan Christout, and Todd Boren. You can download it for free, uh, this chapter from metatheorist.com. Okay, on to the example. According to a well-known account of human decision-making, humans make choices that maximize utility. For the pizza situation, this means that of all of the toppings that can be picked, let us call that the set X, humans will tend to pick a subset, let's call it A, that maximizes utility. But this model is underdefined unless we specify how the utility of A depends on the toppings in it. Now one possibility is the additive model. According to this model, the utility of a subset A is just the sum of the utilities of its elements. Now a problem with this model, however, is that it fails to describe what people do. Think about it. If you would select toppings in this way, you would end up with an overcrowded pizza. Because any topic, topping you like individually, you would put on your pizza. But this, this neglects the toppings you may like individually, you may not like in combination. For instance, I love olives, salami, ham and pineapple. But if you put olives and pineapple together on my pizzas, I may not like it very much. Would you? Okay. An adjusted model could be one where the utility of the set A is not only a function of the utility of the individual toppings, uh, but also of possible interactions between toppings uh, that in combination may increase or decrease tastiness. Now descriptively, this model looks great, much better than the additive. And if you would test it in the lab, we may think that we had the right model. But formal analysis reveals that there is effectively no faster way of computing the maximum utility set than some form of exhaustive search that is considering each and every possible combination of toppings, of which there are an exponential number, uh, two to the size of uh, the set X. Now for say five toppings, this could work, but if X is 30, which is not unrealistic for real world pizzerias, it would take us months, months to make a decision. Now this may seem counterintuitive, but you can mathematically verify this, the set um, 
check out our book for details. But in any case, it's a mathematical consequence of the combinatorial explosion inherent in the search space. And this is what is called uh, intractable. There's the explosion. Intractable models are impossible because they make unrealistic assumptions about resources. In this case, the resource time. Now, let's generalize this idea to other possible constraints. Um, we've seen that tractability is a possibility constraint. So without this constraint, theories make unrealistic assumptions, uh, namely the one that humans are not resource bounded, that they have resource unbounded capacities. Other constraints uh, can vary from capacity to capacity. For instance, for the capacity of groups of people to form uh, subgroups with certain properties, these subgroup formations must be emergible from local social interactions. Also, assuming that we as a species evolved particular cognitive architectures, uh, any such hypothesized architecture must in principle be evolvable. Similarly, cognitive capacities that adults have must be developable. And skills and complex competencies we have, including uh, our capacity for language, must be learnable. And last but not least, cognitive brain capacities that we postulate must be physically realizable in neuronal and other brain processes. How do we integrate? considerations of such possibility constraints in research practice. We can do this through what I'll call the theoretical cycle. In the theoretical cycle, we can make formal derivations of which assumptions are hidden in our theories. We can then assess whether or not those assumptions are plausible, or at least in principle possible, and if needed, we can revise our theories if the assumptions turned out unrealistic. Combining the theoretical cycle with the empirical cycle is useful, especially given the empirical underdetermination of theory by data. This is illustrated by the following figure. We are looking in the infinite set of all logically possible theories for some that adequately explain our target phenomena. Recall, these are real-world capacities. Different theoretical constraints used in the theoretical cycle can function as a searchlight. And by combining them, we may be able to demarcate a smaller area of the fast space of possibilities where good theories of real-world capacities can be found because all of them are, according to the constraints, at least possible. This talk was necessarily brief, but if interested, here are references to the work that forms the basis of this talk. Two papers with my collaborators, Josue Bajua and Mark Blockpool, and a textbook, Cognition and Intractability. Thank you very much for your interest, and if you have any questions or comments, I'd love to hear them. If you have time, please join the panel discussion where I'll be discussing these ideas with the other symposium presenters. But also feel free to post your questions on Twitter if you like. Thanks again and goodbye for now.